ahead and hit start webinar and live on Facebook. Look, we're going and we're recording and we're doing all the things. Hey, Carly, I'm going to throw some stuff in the chat for you. All righty, we're at 631. It looks like we are in fact streaming live on Facebook. We have 25 attendees already piling in. We thank you all so much for being here. And uh, we will give it a few more moments before we really get kicked off. But I just wanted to thank you for joining us. Um, just to be aware of where you are, <laughs> you have landed in a Civic Lex event, running for city council, a brief how-to and stories from the field. We will wait again just three more minutes before we get started, but thank you guys for joining us. If you are joining us from Facebook, um, please navigate your way to the Facebook event page, click location, and you can join us on Zoom. And that way you can ask questions as we go along. It'll be a lot easier for us to see them. Um, we're not certain we'll be able to see if you write on Facebook um, just because of you know, being able to juggle everything is difficult. So if you can join us on Zoom, that would be wonderful. Again, you can go to our face, the Civic Lex Facebook event page for this event. Uh, find your way to the location section of that event and click on that link. You should be able to join us there. So we'll wait just a couple more minutes, see if anyone else wants to jump on and we'll get started. <laughs> Hi, Garrett. I did just poke at poke at the Facebook and see that um, we have a shout out already. So, hey, Kara. Hey, Gigi. <laughs> okay, we are at six thirty-three, and we do have a nice amount of people in with us right now. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see, I'm like, we'll go ahead and get started if I find my notes right. Um, thank you again for being here. You have landed in the Civic Lex Running for City Council, a brief how-to and stories from the field. Um, throughout the meeting, please utilize the Q&A feature um, we really want to have a robust conversation afterwards, and the more questions that you pump in there now, uh, the better off we'll be later on in the evening. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow Civic Lex Programmatic Board members for helping out putting this program together. Um, that would be Carly Mutertis. Of course, I said that wrong because I got super worried about it. Uh, Christine Stanley and Sharon Murphy. And of course, a big thank you to Megan Gullah, who's on this call with us um, for doing all of the background work and really just putting in a whole lot of emails there. So thank you, Megan. Um, so from uh, for some, 2020 brought new light to the effects of local politics and public policy on all of our lives. We hope that many of our friends and neighbors have been inspired to serve their communities by running for public office. Today, we will focus on City Council in Lexington as we look forward to the 2022 election year. Today's program will start with a quick overview of the necessary steps to run for City Council and what offices will be open in 2022. And then we will speak with our panel about what it's like to run for local office. Our panel will feature council members, James Brown from District 1. If you all can wave when I say your names, please do. Uh, James Brown from District 1, Hannah Legree, District 3, and Jennifer Reynolds, District 11, 
as well as former candidates Christine Stanley from District 3 and Christian Motley from District 7. We will conclude our program with some resource uh, commercials from local organizations that work to empower future candidates and build democracy in our community. So without further delay, uh, Megan, could you get us started off? Sure, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share the presentation can do this right. Can you all see this presentation? Awesome. So this is just a really short overview. There we go. Really short overview, just some key information for running for city council. Um, some of this was kind of like, it's hard to find. This information is hard to find. So if there's anything missing from it, um, please let me know in the chat. Um, if there's anything that should be added, let me know. Um, but basically, so in 2022, that's the next election coming up. Um, our district council seats, all of our district council seats are open. That's a two year term um, and council members can serve no more than six consecutive terms. Um, so that's coming up in 2022. At large council seats, which are four year terms are also um, coming up in 2022. So in 2020, we did not have at large um, council elections. <clears throat> Excuse me, and at large council members can serve no more than three consecutive terms because their terms are longer. So those are um, the offices on council that you could run for if you're interested in running um, for this next election. Basic qualifications for um, running for council, you must be at least 18 years of age, um, you have to be a qualified voter and resident of Fayette County um, for no less than one year prior to, to your election. Um, you must be a resident within the district you're running for for at least six months immediately prior to filing as a candidate, and um, you must reside within the district that you've been elected in throughout your term of office. Um, so those are pretty self-explanatory, um, just you know, places of residence and age requirements. Um, your basic timelines for filing documents, um, there's sort of an earliest filing date and then a deadline for filing. Um, so your earliest filing date, and since the dates change, there's no you know specific like the fifth day of this month. It's kind of a, a little bit confusing, but it's no earlier than the first Wednesday after the first Monday in November of the year preceding the year of the office you will appear on the ballot. So I would write that down somewhere and just look it up, you know, on the calendar so what it's going to be in that year. And then the earliest date to affix signatures is the same day. Um, so that earliest filing date and the earliest date to affix signatures, same day. Um, your deadline for filing with a primary election um, is no later than four o'clock p.m. local time on the first Friday following the first Monday in January um, for the day fixed um, for the primary election. So it's a little bit earlier than if there wasn't a primary. And if the date for without a primary is no later than 4 p.m. local time on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in June, preceding the day fixed by law for the holding of the regular election. So again, January for a primary, June for, um, you know, for an election without a primary. And all of your filing documents should be filed with the county clerk. Signatures needed. This was the one that I couldn't find exact information on. Um, I was looking for, I was on the Secretary of State's website, the filing document, and it said it had two signatures, um, but I know that you need 100 signatures. So if someone could clarify this for me and, and tell me where I can find like the exact information um, for people, I can then link that later on. Um, and your signatures, no matter how many you need, um, must be notarized, but that 100 is a pretty important number. Um, projected cost estimates, your filing fee is $50. Um, the actual campaign cost, and I hope we talk more about this, you know, in the coming discussion, can be, um, can be more or less than these numbers. Um, but on average, I'm hearing a campaign for district council is around $10,000. Campaign for at-large council is around $50,000. Um, if we're talking about a mayoral campaign, that can be around $200,000. So it's a lot of money. Uh, to run for elected office, um, depending on, you know, even 10,000 is a lot of money. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. And again, depending on um, your personal finances or how much you, know, you can raise, um, that's, that ratio isn't set in stone either. So it just sort of depends on, on the person and how much you, know, you have to contribute to your own campaign and how much you wanna raise. Potential barriers, finally, um, again, bringing up campaign cost, um, it costs money to run for office. Um, it takes time to raise money if you're needing to raise a lot of money. So I would keep that in mind if you're thinking of running, you know, in the near um, 
the near term, um, the amount of time needed to run a campaign, I'm sure we'll talk, I'm sure we'll talk about all of these issues. Um, but the amount of time needed uh, is pretty substantial. I've heard that it's a full time job in itself. Um, so that can be difficult for a lot of people if you're working, you know, for most of us who are working a regular job to take that time off and really dedicate it to your campaign. Um, your support system during a campaign is really important. So who are the people who can help you do the work? Um, who can help you, you know, plan and set up all of these things that you'll need. You can also raise money. Um, that's, that's a huge issue that um, we'll probably be talking about. Um, your salary if elected to council. Council members aren't paid a lot of money. They're not rich. Um, they're not getting rich off of their, their council salary. So that's something to keep in mind as well. You know, if you're having to change jobs to be on council, is it something that you can afford to do? Um, and for a lot of people, it's not. Um, time requirements if elected to council, although it's treated as more of a, like a part-time job, most of council members are working as if it's full-time. Um, so that can be, you know, if you're not getting paid as much maybe as your full-time job, but you're required to work a full-time amount, um, that can be a barrier. And then the emotional work, it's hard to be on council. It's hard to uh, sort of balance the needs of your constituents and and the relationships on council, you can feel pulled in a lot of different directions, not to mention just the work itself and you know keeping up with your, your family life and your personal life um, while you're also on council. So there are a lot of different things that can make this job really difficult and running for office really difficult, but that doesn't mean um, that you shouldn't do it, that it's not worthwhile and that it's not a worthy thing to do, but just things to keep in mind um, if running is you know possibly in your future, which we hope it is. So I will stop screen sharing and hand it back over to you, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you for that overview. And thank you for the recognition that ultimately our system of governance is not accessible for many to most Lexingtonians and how little representation um, our council can truly have when so many barriers exist to participating. So we just wanna make sure that that is very clear. <laughs> um, and at the same time, we have this beautiful group of people, um, super diverse group that represents us on council. And so we thank you all for making that a priority in your lives and making it happen, even though it does take so much. Um, I would like to reintroduce our panel again, if you could wave when I say your name. Um, we have with us council members, James Brown from District 1, Hannah Legree from District 3, Jennifer Reynolds, District 11, and former candidates, Christine Stanley, District 3, and Christian Motley in District 7. So to start us off, and as a way to get, better, get to know all of you better, um, I would just like to ask everyone to please tell me what inspired you to run for council? And I would love to start with council member Reynolds. Thank you, Natalie, and thanks for having us. Uh, you know, it was funny, it was never on my radar at all to run for public office. Uh, and really it was uh, several people, including uh, former council member Henson talking to me about running uh, that inspired me to run. And the reason why uh, I decided that I would do it in the end is because uh, I've always been involved in my community and been involved in outreach work and nonprofit work. And I realized that our local leaders make a huge difference in our everyday lives in this city. And that I just thought maybe I could make a difference in my community uh, and, and change some of the things uh, in our city for the better. And uh, it was a hard decision. Um, at the time, my son was three years old and I knew that it was gonna be a huge sacrifice uh, and it was. Uh, but it was worth it in the end. And, and I do feel like uh, I'm able sometimes more day, some days more than others, but to make a difference. Thank you, Jennifer. And Councilman uh, James Brown, you had a different entry into council than a lot of others did. So what inspired you to um, stick around <laughs> and run another race? Yeah, well, similar to Councilmember Reynolds, it was it was never really truly on my radar. Uh, I was involved with um, uh, several different things from uh, the PTA at my son's elementary school to the SBDM at my the site based decision making council at my um, at son and daughter's high school. Then also I was uh, involved with my neighborhood association and then also uh, Commerce Lex and and the local um, L Bar Realtor Association. Uh, 
from working with all those organizations and seeing how they all interacted and impacted our neighborhoods, our communities, and our city as a whole, when I was approached about uh, being on council, I was a little reluct reluctant. But you know, the case was made to me that you know I was stretched thin, doing a lot of work, spending a lot of time, and this was a way to kind of concentrate the effort and probably actually have more impact and be more effective to making our community more inclusive and better for everyone that, that calls Lexington home. So I, I accepted the appointment and have, um, you know, ran several campaigns just because I, I do understand the importance of it and, and appreciate having the opportunity to represent uh, a diverse uh, group of people in our city and in, um, in, in working to make life better for, uh, for all Lexingtonians. Thank you, uh, Councilman Brown. And Christine, could you tell us what inspired you to run? Sure. Um, I was in a position um, last year where um, I had the time. It was always something that I wanted to try. Um, I had been, from my legal side, because I'm also an attorney, from my legal side, I actually started my legal career at the Kentucky League of Cities, where I worked with mayors and council people all over Kentucky, actually educating them on kind of Robert's rules and, and city ordinances and helping them draft those things. So for years, I had like kind of like one foot in, one foot out on a municipal law and um, kind of city politics. And we were, my friends and I were sitting around the Thanksgiving table and we were just like, let's just do it. Let's just try it. Um, if not now, when it was kind of like one of those things and um, I, I don't regret it. I would do it again, maybe not anytime soon, <laughs> but like um, Councilman, Councilwoman Reynolds and Councilman Brown, I mean, it's just a great opportunity for you to understand your community and address very, very specific issues that your neighbors need you to address and it's I think I think and I and I think they would agree with me that it's very fulfilling in the sense that like you can see um all your hard work in action um a little bit faster than maybe you know donating to something you know you don't know you don't know the people who you're helping um you don't know if that bridge will get built, but you know, sitting on council that you will be there and make sure that the things that you said you're going to do will get done. You're muted, Natalie. I'm woman Legree. I'm next, Natalie. Is that what you said? Yes, please. Okay, excellent. Um, so the question was, what inspired you to run for city council? And um, you know, I had not ever envisioned myself as an elected official um, until I decided to run. I, I hadn't had that conversation with a lot of people in my life, um, but for the past decade, in one way or another, I've been working to connect University of Kentucky students to the Lexington community and to get them invested in the Lexington community through service or through other types of engagement and sometimes through activism. And, and so, I had a conversation with my partner about my values and how I wanted to put them into practice. And, and he said, you know, what about city council? Have you considered talking to um, our current council member at the time, um, Jake Gibbs, about his role and, and how maybe you could translate some of your values and interests with University of Kentucky students to, to work within, um, within government? I said, okay. I'll talk to him. And when I talked to council member Gibbs, who also had a, a background in, in educating and working with, um, with college students, I, I felt really excited about what he told me. You know, he said, yeah, you get to meet so many people. You get to put your values into practice. You get to learn so much about the city. And it's really, it can be really positive work. It's hard work, but, it, but it's worth it. And, and so I decided, I said, why not? I, I, I'll think a little bit more about this. I'll have some more conversations. Um, and then I decided to, to run. And he was right. And he was right about that. Not, not only in the role itself, but the process of running. 
because you meet so many people. I mean, I got to meet the people on, on this, even on this panel, and that has been an incredibly rewarding experience, just to know that there are so many people who are invested who you haven't met yet. And, and so that was my primary motivator. And um, last, but certainly not least, uh, Christian Motley, could you tell us what inspired you to run for office? Yeah, and, and first of all, I'd say thank you for, for giving me the opportunity as a, uh, a candidate who ended up on the wrong side of the map uh, in November, having the opportunity to come in and share just a little bit about my experience. Of course, um, I just have great uh, respect for everybody um, who's a part of this conversation. Um, you know, my entire career has been about um, working in service of, of young people and families. And, you know, uh, I worked at the federal level uh, at the state level um, and for nonprofits, thinking about education opportunity, uh, edu educational opportunities and economic mobility uh, in particular. And what I learned at each level of government is that uh, some of the most powerful impacts that are made uh, come at the local level. And, um, you know, I had conversations with, uh, as I was thinking about it, you know, had conversations with folks who had run for office before and served. Um, frankly, I had conversations with folks in my neighborhood um, and wanted to get a sense of, you know, if the things that I was seeing in terms of challenges were really synced uh, with, uh, with the needs that, that really reflected where the community was. And, and I felt like I could make a contribution. And so, um, yeah, I, I got my clipboard and, and got my little signatures and, and, and got on the ballot. Well, thank you all so much. I'm hearing a lot of you reference um, how much you learned in the process. So we'll kick off uh, our conversation with that question. Well, soon, close to kick off. Um, but what did you learn? And this is open to anyone that is here. Um, please keep it as short as possible, but we would love to hear um, what did you learn from running about your community? Any small things that you learned that you didn't expect? And that is open to anyone, or I will call on you. <laughs> I, I learned a lot about the community. I mean, so much that it was uh, just surprising to me how much I thought I knew and then I didn't know once I once I started uh, campaigning. I, I met with tons of people and neighborhoods and neighborhood associations and heard what was important to them that I didn't know before. Then I dove into the big questions that are going on in the city, whether it be the urban service boundary or whether it be, um, you know, past conflicts that the local government had ha had had. I, I mean, I felt like it really helped prepare me uh, in office. And then when you get in office, you learn even more uh, every day that that you didn't know before. So it's a constant learning process. That's something that I really enjoy about it. Um, but I, I think that until you start running, you don't even realize uh, how how much you have to learn, I guess I should say. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, same question. Anybody else in the panel? As far as something that was just surprising that you learned about your community or that was just really useful to you or valuable in some way? I'm happy to share. You know, I think, you know, the thing that I uh, learned, I think, early on is that um, you, know, you can't be afraid to ask for things. Um, you know, there it, running for office can be a very isolating experience, and um, sometimes it is something that you put on yourself, and you believe, you know, you, you need resources for your campaign. You know, you need to um, try to help get your name out there. Maybe you want somebody, uh, you want to get your yard signs out in the yard. You you got to ask. Um, and you got to ask for help, and you will be surprised by the number of people who will support you, who will help you make phone calls and knock doors. Um, help you figure out in this uh, in this context, you know, maybe uh, how to do a little bit more with Zoom uh, than you um, thought you would. Uh, but yeah, I learned a lot about um, you know how folks would support you, and, and that if you ask, uh, folks will uh, help. Thank you so much. We have a question in the um, Q and A that kind of goes along with some of our others that we were looking at, um, just around the impact on your children and your partners. So the question we had prepared was really how much time 
did your partners have to put into your campaign? But the question in the chat was, for those with children, how do you balance your public service with your family obligations? Um, I feel like balance is kind of just not a possibility for y'all most of the time. But I would love to hear from you as to what that looks like for your families um, from you know the time that you're trying to spend with everyone and also the amount of work that they have to put in to support you to get to you to where you are. I'll, I'll jump on that one. Um, campaigning and, and also governing, being in office is, is, is pretty taxing of your time on your family and your partner. Uh, I know when, you know, I, I try to be as inclusive as possible for my, my wife and my kids campaigning. They were walking with me. They were passing out door hangers. They were uh, waiting patiently while I was talking to constituents on their porches. And, and, and it, it takes that whole family to make it, to make it work. But to be honest with you, that only works uh, one, the first or the second campaign after that, you can't get them to walk with you. <laughs> you almost have to make your kids do it like a punishment. Um, but, but, but it's important that they understand and, and, and for my wife and I, and I, and I would say others, uh, partners understand how important this work is to you and to the community. So, uh, when, when you get elected, you, it, it ain't just you going into office, you take your family with you because you carry that work back home and it, and, and it, and it doesn't stop. Uh, the same thing, once you get in office, uh, um, the, the same thing with the issues, that's who you talk and have those conversations with and knock around ideas. And, you know, to this day, my uh, two older kids are adults and they call me all the time, weighing in on issues, sharing their opinions. And I think it's valuable. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it becomes a, a, a family affair, so to speak, when you're in office. In the same lane, um, what kind of support staff or team um, did you all put together to, to make your campaigns happen? Um, or I'll answer. I saw I saw Councilmember Reynolds um, unmute as well. I'll I'll answer very quickly the first question because I asked my partner this. I said, "How many hours a week do you think you spent on my campaign?" He said, "At least twenty five. And because it because it, it involves a lot of conversation, you know, or getting people's input, or walking, or you know, talking through things. So. I, I said, well, I don't even want to say how many hours I put in then, you know, and so my team, um, I started with a campaign director and a treasurer. We recruited a fundraising director. We had a couple of people who provided input and assistance with communication and advisor to, advisors to the campaign who knew about the inner workings of government and had different perspectives on the issues than I did. Um, I had someone who consulted with field strategy and with, with phone calling and telling the story of the campaign, um, a volunteer manager, someone who was great at design, event managers when we were allowed to have those, and, and then volunteers who put in, a, in various types of time that, um, that was really valuable that aligned with their interests and their availability. Um, and, yeah, it can take over all your all your time and all of your thoughts. And I think Christian made a really good point. With a lot of this, you have to ask. You know, there are people who have so many talents and so much potential, and they've never maybe they've never worked on a campaign, but they could see themselves engaging in this project. And sometimes you just have to see that potential and talk to them about it and ask, and 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 they'll sh they'll show up. And that's hard at first, you know. For sure. Thank you so much. Um, if I could add to that real quick. Please do. Okay. So I think that for all of you who actually are planning to run for an office, all those people that Hannah just listed, you need to write down. Right? Write those people down because that way you know what your ask is. Like you can't ask someone to be like, hey, I want you to be with me, but I don't, I don't necessarily know what you want, uh, what I want you to do. Because I think kind of people are willing to do what they signed up for. And unless you know what you need them to do for your campaign, it gets, you have a lot of people, but they're just all like holding hands, you know, they're not doing anything. So I think that if you wanna run for office, you write down all those people and figure out who you need as a, as a favor, as a friend, who you need to hire, 
Like, is that part of your budget? Can you hire uh, these managers for events? Can you hire these folks for these? Are these friends that are like gonna do it out of their kindness of their heart? That plays into your budget and how much you wanna raise. 10,000 is a, is a nice starting point, but if you can raise more, if you have a fundraising manager, I think, I think, and so for those of you who don't know, Hannah and I uh, were against each other in the primary. Um, and I think Hannah outraised me by like 10,000. So I had raised 10,000 and I think she was up to 22. I'm not sure those are like numbers in my head, um, but I think she outraised me. And I think there's something to be said about having those people with dedicated jobs for fundraising, get that, in place so that you have a good foundation for you to espouse your ideas to your community. Um, I just want to say that. Oh, and my spouse, oh my God, it was like, he 24 hours. <laughs> I was like in the middle of the night, like, what do you think about this? And he'd be like, yes and no. And like, what about this outfit? Yes and no. We don't have children. So he was like everything, like everything. And my two campaign managers were, um, two of my really closest closest friends and it was great because I work they work so at 3 a.m we were all you know on the same page and so whoever you have with you make sure that you can talk to them at the same time I think I would be hard if I was the only one up at 3 a.m and like no one was responding to me <laughs> so it was nice to have them and we were all on the same schedule so Thank you so much, Christine. I um, kind of want to roll in that same vein again, as far as, um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot already about the cost <laughs> um, to your family, to your friends. It sounds like, you know, you kind of have to lean on everyone and financial costs. I really appreciate you for bringing up the fact that, you know, that 10,000 marker is just the starting point um, for those things. So, I guess I, for some of you who have run before, what has made you do it again? For those who have run several different campaigns, um, I think that just, is that just you, Councilman Brown? I'm looking, I don't remember. Jennifer, you didn't, did you run twice or you didn't have an opponent this year? I didn't have an opponent this year, so I didn't have to have a campaign. campaign. Well, I guess this question is particularly for you, Councilman Brown, why would you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, partly because of the, the, the same way I got into it. If people encourage you to do it, um, if, if, you know, if so people- just straight peer pressure? Um, no, so, and then some of it is, is, is the value add that you, that you see that you're contributing to the community. Uh, you, you, when I first got into it, um, I remember Mayor Gray told me, he said, you gotta, there's two things you gotta love. You gotta love people and you gotta love problems. And I, and I love, and I love both. So, you know, that's, that's, and then the people that I serve with on council, uh, to be honest with you, the council members that we have, the people in city government, uh, the people in the community, for the most part, every, they're all good people, good hearted people that want to see the best for, for our community. And they're willing to work and give their time and, and dedication to that. I'll, I'll, I'll do it with them. So that's, you know, that's one of the reasons that, that, that I, that I've ran um, uh, multiple times. But um, it's uh, it's 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 challenging, and it's and and to be honest with you, the campaigns. You know, I, I was unopposed this last election. These campaigns are going to look different going forward. There's been some changes. COVID has changed things. The early voting has changed things. Uh, the campaigns of the past are, are going to look a lot different from the campaigns of the future. So that's I, I know that's off the topic of your question, but. Um, it's, it's, it's some of, it ain't peer pressure, it's encouragement and then serving with uh, other good folks. I, I, I'd like to mention, cause I, <clears throat> some will remember that I was on the ballot for a little while uh, back in 2018. And, you know, I, uh, it's important to say that, you know, this stuff is important. Um, so, you know, when you're running for city council you always have to lean back on your why and if your why is just to sit at the horseshoe or to be mentioned in Herald Leader every once in a while, um, it's probably not a good reason to run. And I remember after 2018, I think it was the first meeting uh, of our neighbors in 2019, we got together at the Gainesway Community Center. I'm thinking about the moment I knew I was going to run again. Uh, and it was 
that, you know, maybe a week prior to this meeting, uh, someone that had been shot, uh, probably 50 feet, uh, 100 feet uh, from where we were meeting. Uh, and we were having a conversation about dog parks. Uh, and it was a reminder, again, and this is in uh, a year that we've just experienced, especially last year, uh, where we lost so many young people. And even now, I think I think we had uh, uh, had the highest number of homicides uh, back in, in 2020. And so this is an issue that is like really important. And, you know, we were talking about um, dog parks and, and we it just, I wanted to ensure that, you know, some of these uh, really, really critical issues about how we were shaping our community were, were talked about um, in the campaign setting. And so I just want to highlight, it, um, you know, as you're running for office, your why is really important. And um, the work that is being done by these council members who are on this call right now is really important. And um, if you jump on that ballot, you know, you got to make sure you know that you're making a, a substantive contribution. Christian, thank you so much for bringing that up and reminding us of just the heavy work that all of our council members deal with and people, you know, all of us who are really committed to our community and work in different, you know, ways deal with. So I'd like to just hear from you all, how do you take care of yourselves emotionally? And how do you put together those boundaries? That question isn't on our list, but, um, you know, I just really want us to be able to put some words to that as far as how you've taken care of yourself emotionally and physically, mentally through your campaigns. And then also as council members for those of you who are serving. I don't do that. So I'll probably be quiet. <laughs> I, can, I can chime in a little bit because I, I wanted to touch upon, I, I pulled, I had photocopied all of my signatures when I got it. Um, and I, I think this is something that all the council members have touched on, um, especially Christian, is the ask. And I will, I will let you know right now, going door to door and asking for signatures was the scariest thing I have ever done in my life, in my life. And it's scary because you're on someone's property. I did this in December, so it gets dark at six o'clock. It's dark. I'm a black woman. I had my husband behind me every single door, every time, because I'm not supposed to be there. You don't know who I am. And this, this was unprecedented to me. Um, and so that these seven pages of a hundred, actually, I'll show, I'll show you all. I don't know if you can see. So they're pretty like this, each sheet has 25. Um, and at the bottom, like Megan said, you have to get them notarized. Um, and I did them, uh, my husband and I did them all ourselves with the help of one of my campaign managers who came out one afternoon and went down. And I think the thing that people don't realize is that each candidate has to have their own set of signatures. Hannah and I could not go to the same house and ask for signatures. So when you're asking people for signatures, you have to make sure to ask them, have you signed for anyone already? Because if they have, those, those signatures cancel each other out. And that's why they say, even though the minimum is 100, you get 200. Because if at the end they're matching, you have to give the street number and you have to give the street. So they know everyone's name and address. And so they literally sit there and they match people up. And so um, that was something that I actually forgot what the question was, but I wanted to make sure that you guys knew. <laughs> No, I never thought of that. I would have absolutely never thought of the fact that you can't have two different people, one person signing for two different candidates. Nope. Nope. And that, and that is why I think part of preparing and why we're having this Zoom is so that if you're thinking about it, that deadline is literally next year, right? And I, I, Hannah, who lives around the corner from me, got to my neighborhood before I did. And so I'm like, I'm going to go to my neighbors. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm sure most certainly I'm not. I'm going to Hollywood and other places that I've never been before. And um, 
I hope that you all don't have as many candidates as we did. We had three and we all live within a mile of each other. Four. Oh, oh, I forgot. I forgot about Charlie. Sorry, we had four. <laughs> and we all lived within one mile of each other. So, you know, there's only so many people that you can go to um, that are in your comfort zone. You had to go out of your comfort zone. And again, I forgot what the question was. I had an answer for that one too, but I wanted to make sure that I told you all that it's it's 25 signatures a sheet and they, they can't match another candidate's signatures. Christina, the question I think was, was it something about balance? Cause I- Oh, I, I, balance. I, <laughs> I, but I just, I don't, I don't know, you know, in a campaign context, I don't even know if that's a fair, fair question. Well, um, if you look in the chat, Jennifer Reynolds has put a great um, yeah. response <laughs> in there. And I think I just want to like in the intro, you know, thinking about time, um, I want to make sure that everybody sees that because she yeah. says there is no balance. It's all consuming. And I feel like all of you have echoed that in some way or another. And I will, yeah. you know, I was kind of quiet when we were, you know, we're having the conversation about, you know, if you have a spouse or if you have children, because I don't have any of those things. And I will say that it was a consideration, like maybe this is a good time, you know, to be able to run because I, you know, I don't have those same responsibilities uh, when I get home. So it's a conversation with my boss and my manager, yes. Um, and certainly sort of self-reflection and conversations with my neighbors, but um, it was as part of the math. And especially in 2020, you know, for folks, if you're thinking about running against an incumbent, you know, I run against a guy who got elected, you know, when I was in second grade. And that kind of name idea is pretty expensive. And so I figured whatever he had, whatever he raised, I wanted to double it or triple it. Um, when I got, you, we talked about the signature process, um, you know, I've got somewhere in the neighborhood of like 230 uh, and, and audited out some signatures to Christine's point. Um, so, you know, whatever happened in 2018, we were going harder. And so there's no balance really. Um, it's, you know, do you want to do the work uh, to, to try and win your race and um, you know are you ready to serve and of course I'll leave to my uh, our council members to, to talk about what it looks like after you win. Uh, can I just say something real quick now that I know we're short on time. Okay, I, you're good you're good. I think this is one of the most important considerations when you're trying to decide whether to run for council or not. Um, is that, you know, the campaign literally consumed every second of my time. I was working, I would go to work, I'd work on the campaign, go back to work. Then I would like, I was teaching ballet, I would wear pants that all I had to do was take off my shirt and then put heels on and then run to a meeting like every, every day. It, it, and it was insane on the weekends I was working on questionnaires or, or, or things. And I thought in my mind, I'm just doing this for a year. And then after that, things will change. And the reality is once you get on council, they do not change. If anything, in 2019, I was more busy and it was pre-COVID. And so there were events and dinners and meetings constantly and you're new. So you need to get to meet everybody and know what's going on. And so when people talk about balance, it's true. There's just not any, and you have to find a way to do something that's sustainable. Um, because really that kind of rhythm isn't sustainable. And I feel like I finally found that rhythm and now I'm going to have to have a, a second job and I don't know how I'm going to do it and I'm gonna have to change uh, what I have been doing. And so those are, some people are lucky enough and I was lucky enough the first term not to have to have another job, but a lot of us have to make ends meet and have to have another job and it's um, you for your own health, you have to set those boundaries. Sometimes for me, it's that, I mean, and I'm, I, I'm okay telling everybody this, when I come home in the evening, I'm not going to be checking my email or responding to every message that I have on social media. If it's an emergency, if it's something urgent, I will respond. Otherwise it can wait until I have the dedicated time the next day. And that's the same on the weekend. Um, and so some people do, some people are like just constantly all the time working. Uh, but I think for me, I have to find some time in my schedule where, um, I'm not doing that. And then sometimes you have to get away for a weekend or you have to go to another city to have a, a nice dinner with your family, um, just so that you can have some time that's uninterrupted because often when we go out, um, you know, we we run into our constituents, which is great, but sometimes you just need time where, 
you can just be you with your family or, or by yourself. So anyway, all that to say, I, I do think it's important consideration. People told me, well, you have a kid, so maybe you shouldn't run. And I think that's silly because we need young people and we need parents and we need everybody on council. Um, however, uh, I've had a lot of support. I had a ton of support on my campaign. Um, I had a great team. I think that's vital. Uh, I, I love my team. I cannot say enough about my campaign manager and my team. Uh, and then also now I have a lot of support. I live near my parents. My parents take care of my son all the time. I have a ton of friends. Um, and if I did not have that, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, Hannah, you had yourself unmiked for a moment. I just wanted to give you a, a second to say anything if you wanted to. That, that was a little bit of an accident, but I will take a second and, and and I, I want to concur with what uh, Council Member Reynolds has said in that um, you have to figure out your own balance. And, and sometimes that can be very challenging. And I think as Christian uh, mentioned, it can feel very lonely. Uh, there are times when you know, you're, you're trying to be outward facing on the campaign or even as a council member, um, but there's so much happening behind the scenes. You know, you've got your team and, and, and you're going around, you're doing events or you're trying to be visible, but you're always working behind the scenes too. And I think that that work can, you know, it's not always, it's not always in the public eye, but, but it, it does add up. Um, and I think that if you don't remember uh, who you are and what your other interests are, then you won't be as good of a public servant or as strong of, of a candidate. And it can be really easy to lose sight of those things when there's so much work to do. But, you know, that's, so that's my advice. Try to remember your non-negotiables um, because you'll really need them. Um, and you have to set time aside for those things. And they can just be small, even if it's just making something or making phone calls that aren't for your campaign or having different types of conversations. That keeps you in check with who you are at your core and that keeps you strong so that when you're receiving criticism or maybe you've, you've gotten some bad press or maybe you're feeling shaky, you still know who you are and you know that you're worthy. And I think that that's something, um, no matter what the outcome of your race, that you have to internalize during the process. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, in the interest of time, we will move on to the next part of our program. We will come back to our panelists in just a moment for uh, Q&A. We have some amazing questions. Thank you all um, for, for being so prolific with those. Um, so for the moment, I, right now, we want to recognize that Civic Lex is not an organization that works with candidates. Um, we do not empower candidates, we do not do any of those things, but Lexington and the state of Kentucky have loads of different resources that do those things exactly. Um, so we have a few people with us today, and I would like to, um, each of these uh, next presenters have three minutes to give us a little commercial about their program. So if you're here, um, hopefully you can connect with them uh, to, in some way or another. So first off, Carly, if you can come off of mute um, and, uh, and you know, thank you for putting your video on, I will start your timer and say, go on ahead and let us know about the uh, New Leaders Council. All right, hi everybody. Uh, New Leaders Council is a progressive leadership organization that provides a six month program of training around all the skills you would need to run for office, managing campaigns, creating startups, uh, networking. The purpose of NLC is to create leaders that take their activism back to their communities and workplace. Uh, I went through the program, uh, not because I necessarily wanted to run for office, uh, but I now feel really equipped and emboldened that if I wanted to run for office, I have the tools to do so. It is a six month, uh, one weekend a month program. Uh, each month having a focus on a different important element in leadership, including communication, financing, and policy. Uh, there are 50 chapters of the NLC around the country. We have a statewide chapter. So uh, the chapter brings together folks from all over the state. There are a lot of Louisville folks. So I would love to be able to bring more of my fellow Lexingtonians 
into the NLC program. So uh, if you are interested, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, through, to me through CivicLex. I'm presently uh, the Kentucky Chapters Board as one of the two selections chairs. Uh, you can also find more information about the program at www.newleaderscouncil.org slash Kentucky. And I think I should point out that there are a lot of like leadership programs out there that are really expensive. And this one actually include has a deposit that you get back. So it is uh, in many ways uh, free. So uh, I really encourage you to check it out if you're, you're thinking about running for office. Thank you, Carly. Can you throw that um, website in the chat box for us, please? Thank you so much. All righty. Well, next up, if uh, Walt Gaffield could take himself um, or put his camera on. Um, Walt is from Fayette County Neighborhood Council. Uh, he was the chief budget officer for the department, for a department or a cabinet in the Kentucky state government for over 25 years. So I'm sure that if you want to get your brain wrapped around how those budgetary issues work, He's your guy. <laughs> um, that is a lot of experience and a lot of information. So thank you for being with us, Walt. If you could please tell us a little bit more about the Fayette County Neighborhood Council. Okay, the, uh, the Fayette County Neighborhood Council is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we are an umbrella organization for uh, homeowners associations and neighborhood associations, and we also have individual members. Uh, we, we primarily exist to uh, help neighborhoods, help organize neighborhoods, uh, and, and we have a countywide presence. We have uh, rural neighborhoods, uh, urban neighborhoods, suburban neighborhoods, and we try to have geographic and uh, coverage and diversity. Now, we're not always successful in doing that. Uh, one of the more significant things we've done, uh, the consent decree uh, and you all, you all pay taxes on this. We, lit we were the initial litigators against both the city and the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency. The city for not uh, following the uh, US Clean Water Act and the Environmental Protection Agency for not enforcing it. Um, and we had, we had basically uh, sewage in people's basements all over town and we were feeding all that information to the EPA. Uh, we are, in terms of politics, we're, we're heavily involved with city government in all kinds of issues. Uh, we're, we're almost like an unpaid uh, city council member and we answer all kinds of questions. We tell them where to find things and how to do things. Uh, people in neighborhoods are people who are heavily engaged in their communities. Some of our members are the most engaged uh, members in council districts. Uh, as a 501c3, we're totally nonpartisan. Uh, Lexington is not uh, a, a partisan government. I mean, essentially, you're not a Democrat or a Republican. And frankly, that works really well because council members with different ideas work better together. We don't have the same level of dysfunction as you see in Washington. Uh, if, you're, if you're campaigning, uh, what we tell our neighborhoods is if you're going to bring in a candidate to speak to your neighborhood, you should invite all the candidates uh, being nonpartisan. The, the neighborhood council will never endorse anybody. Uh, a lot of our members, because they're really active in their communities, will individually decide to work for somebody or not or place signs or do this or that. Uh, my recommendation if you're running for council would be you know, get to know your neighborhoods, know where they are, know who the leaders are, know what issues they're interested in, and, and develop ideas of your own and, and, and be able to answer questions on them. Uh, you know, to, to run for office, you need charisma, you need money, and you have to have ideas that, you, that you're interested in implementing or things you're interested in getting done. I, I can, I'll stay later and can talk some more. Thank you so much, Walt, um, and thank you for staying, sticking around. I feel like that the resource that you all offer is probably consistently understated. Mm -hmm. um, so lastly, with us, we have Cindy Heine. Um, could you please come off and turn your camera on? She is with the League of Women Voters of Lexington, and she has helped to organize several candidate forums and debates. So Cindy, please tell us about the League of Women Voters. 
Thank you very much, Natalie and Megan, for inviting me to come and talk about the League of Women Voters. The League has been around for 101 years, and it was created by the suffragists after they advocated for more than 70 years to win the right to vote, uh, the win, win the right for women to vote. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified and the League got organized by those suffragists to inform and support the millions of women who were going to exercise this new right to vote. The group became nonpartisan from the very beginning and we continue to hold a nonpartisan status. We do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Membership is open to women and men. We have a lot of men in the membership who are 16 years of age and older. Our mission is empowering voters and defending democracy. So we work to encourage informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of public policy issues and we work to influence those policies through education and advocacy. If you join the league, you join locally, but you also become a member at the state and at the national level. We do a lot of work supporting voters. Voter registration is high on our priority list. And we have a new project called We Vote, working to register high school students at our local high schools. We provide information about candidates. Those of you on the panel, many of you participated in our forums last year. We hold forums at the state and local level. Nonpartisan, we try to be sure we're very fair to everyone. Uh, we also have one of those, um, probably for candidates, irritating uh, online voter guides, asking people to ask answer questions so people can get a sense of who you are um, and compare your answers to your opponents. We put together a blue sheet every after every major um, election listing every official state, local and national who represents you so that uh, the citizens can have that information and contact them. We're creating an observer core watching uh, government entities and agencies just monitoring to see what the issues are, what the successes are, what the challenges are. We have a fabulous book club. We read wonderful books um, about history and political issues. We just finished reading Cast uh, and had a fabulous discussion about that. We hold a lot of policy meetings. Uh, we recently had a meeting on the Mayor's Commission on Racial Justice and Equality. We've had uh, issues that are addressed at the state level. And joining the League is just a good way to get some good basic background as if you are cons ever considering running for public office or getting engaged. And I'll put our website up. That's the best way to learn more about us, our events, ways that you can um, either join us in meetings. You don't have to be a member to listen in on our meetings, but it's a way to join um, or uh, register for our meetings. I have to say, as I listen to the candidates, to the council members and the candidates, um, how much we appreciate the effort and the commitment and the dedication that you put in. Anybody who's willing to run for public office needs to be congratulated because it is a commitment of time and service and heart. It takes heart to be able to do this. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you so much, Cindy. I personally have a little crush on your organization. I think it's amazing, the history behind it, all of it. So thank you so much for being with us. Also, thank you, Carly and Walt, for those little commercials. We so appreciate you all. Um, lastly, I will say that we did get a note from Mark Streety. He is with the Lexington Urban Neighborhood Alliance, and he could not be with us today, but I did want to pass along that organization as a resource, the Lexington Urban Neighborhood Alliance. He says that the Lexington Urban Neighborhood Alliance, or LUNA, is a resource to promulgate questions and receive answers to a dozen or so critical neighborhood questions from all that seek city office. We intend to draw better understanding and deeper ability toward the pers preservation and protection of our existing Lexington neighborhoods and to share these questions and 
and answers across Luna na member neighborhood associations and beyond. He also remarks that we also have the op an opportunity to consider taking formal positions on these same matters given our 501c4 status. So that does keep them separate from, I'm sure, the neighborhood associations in general. So for now, if everyone, if you are going to stick around for our Q&A time, and I would encourage all of our panelists and our resources to do that um, as well, uh, please come off of, uh, take your cameras on, and we will start with um, the very first question that we got uh, during this time was how many of you have other jobs or businesses that you run? That was definitely covered somewhat within this. Um, and what would you say your ratio of time slash energy spent between those jobs and being on council looks like? I'll, I'll start. Um, when I was running for office, I was working 40 hours a week, sometimes more uh, for the University of Kentucky. And I just spent all my free time working on the campaign. All my weekends, my nights, sometimes my mornings, you know, before work. And then right now I work at the University of Kentucky still on a 30 hour schedule. And then I, I do my council work um, in a very similar way to the campaign. But again, we talked about um, boundaries, you know, and some districts, the type of communication, the number of neighborhood association meetings, um, the engagement of your residents, the, you know, that's going to vary maybe over the course of the year um, and depending on, on your district as well. Yeah, I'll, ch I'll chime yeah. in. Yes. Okay, I was going to say, I'll, I'll chime in next. I'm a... Um, I'm also a real estate agent, but I, I don't sell as much. I'll put it this way. The, the year that I got appointed to council, I was coming off my best year selling real estate. And the first year that I was appointed to council was my worst year selling real estate. So um, uh, thankfully, my, you know, my wife, is she works full time. She's an RN. She's supportive of uh, the work on council. We have a great, great budgetary relationship which affords me the opportunity to spend as much time as needed uh, representing the district and, and working on council. And I still sell real estate, but uh, not to the not to the tune that I that I used to. And it's just basically just time management. You, you, being a real estate agent, you have to be there and be available for your clients. And it's just hard to do that uh, being on council. Um, I will say that I think um, I, I'm an attorney, I work full time. Um, it was very hard for me to even imagine giving that up, right? So there are so many hurdles and whatever and all the things that I had to do to, to become that. And being on council was something that I also wanted, but I didn't have an idea of a, of a time or a situation where I couldn't do both. And maybe that was something that I just was gonna learn the hard way. <laughs> um, but for me, it was really, really important to continue serving my clients that I've that I've met for my, my practice, but then also serving my community. Um, and I don't know what that looks like being on council, but as a campaign person, it was 24 hours. Like I said before, it was three o'clock in the morning. It was waking up at 6 a.m. and getting my memos done, getting my um, anything I needed for court done, making sure that my court appearances did not coincide with something else that I had planned or making sure, you know, so it was a lot of organization. Um, I'm not sure, you know, with children or whatever, but I think like with all things is that you have to be organized. You have to have a schedule. If it's an online schedule, if it's a, a, a board on your room, if it's a agenda book, you have to be organized and make sure that you do have the time. And for the balance question, I was going to say for COVID times, it was really, really hard because my thing is I'm going to go to yoga. I'm going to go to the gym I'm gonna, and I couldn't go anywhere. And so I had to reimagine what having a balanced life to look like because I could just sit in this attic <laughs> all day long doing something. Um, so for you all that are going to you know, look into this, I don't know what it's going to look like in 2022. I hope you get to do the events again. But if it if you can't, you have to figure out 
what your balance looks like in your home. I think that's a great segue into what do you all think that COVID-19 is going to do to running? <laughs> Basically, you know, what, what kind of changes do you all foresee, you know, the 2022 race having to deal with, um, with everything up in the air and, and everything else? You all had to learn on the fly. <laughs> Many on this call had to learn immediately how you were going to shift and make that happen. Um, but for everyone else, how do you, what do you think um, the takeaways are going to be? from COVID and, the, and how that's gonna affect future campaigns. Natalie, if you don't mind, I'll just, I'll just give my opinion and I'll say that I, I'll probably have to go after this question. I hear my wife uh, beating on the floor, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> go tend to that. Um, now I think in Christian, Christian and, um, and Hannah and whoever had to run during this, uh, this uh, pandemic can speak to it more than, more than, I, than I, I, I can, but I think it's gonna change how you connect with your, uh, with your base. Um, I think, you know, knocking on doors and standing on porches and having face-to-face -face conversations are going to be hit or miss. And I think, you know, people are going to rely more on social media, mail-ins, uh, and other ways to connect with uh, voters and people that they represent. And, and, and it's also going to throw off the time schedule. You, before you knew when you had to send mailers out, when you had to do this and do that. But now, if you know, if early voting is here to stay, and I hope it is, um, and other voting options, I think it's going to uh, change and dictate how you run a whole campaign and, and and do your schedule. And you have to connect with people. That's you know, that's that's how you build name ID. That's how you uh, find out what they're interested in, what what things you need to focus on. And if you can't make that connection, then 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 it's then it, then it, you're you're at a loss. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe the folks that had to run campaigns this year can better talk about the challenges that they faced and how they overcame them uh, with this COVID. Thank you. Yeah, I can, ju I can jump in there. I mean, my biggest challenge is uh, uh, during uh, COVID last year was being an extrovert and looking forward to all the back slapping and handshaking and eating egg sandwiches on the porch. I didn't get to do any of that uh, <laughs> in 2020. So uh, I wish I had that. I do think it means that you have to have uh, ensure that you have a really strong team. Um, you know, I work with SNA Strategies, uh, a company that you know had folks that knew what they were doing, and you know, uh, it really was important to be able to sit down and do the math and have honest expectations. Um, not even expectation. I mean, I knew how many votes uh, were going to be cast. Um, uh, in, in my case, I knew when we didn't hit that number that we were going to fall short. But what it also means is. Uh, in the strategy, um, you know, to uh, Councilmember Brown's point, you know, when that first mail piece lands uh, becomes really important. How you leverage these new platforms that allow you to text, uh, uh, it becomes really important. Um, and, and just knowing that you have to be able to get uh, in touch with voters in, in different ways. Um, uh, it, it, it frankly may uh, make campaigns uh, just a little bit more uh, expensive as well. So, um, the number one thing I think is just making sure you have a strong team to, to help you make those strategic decisions. And when, go ahead, Hannah. Um, I, all I was going to add, and, and I concur with all of Christian's um, points is that, you know, we, ha we made multiple timelines. So we made multiple mailing timelines um, based on how people might vote. We had to push everything up. We, we knew we had to pivot our strategy really quickly when we knew we couldn't go around. Um, we had planned on running a, a really strong ground campaign. You know, I don't have children. I thought, you know what, I, this is me. This is my project. I'm gonna get out. I'm gonna be um, walking on the streets. I'm gonna be talking to people. And so we realized um, very quickly that we needed to use social media differently. Um, and so that's why I started the the let's have a chat series along with my team because we also said, well, we need to get other people's voices out here. So like a, a, a weekly chat where we elevated um, other people's stories and, and um, talked to them about good things that were happening in the community that were connected to some of the issues that were germane to the, the campaign. And so I also wanna say that, the, you know, this is space, you know, you're a leader in the community and if you have a platform, there are lots of different ways to use it. Um, but we definitely had to change our strategy and, and, and be nimble 
Um, and I think that if, if future candidates are going to deal with people's hesitancy to, to meet in person, they're gonna have to use all different types of modalities in order to connect with people. And also, I think very importantly, to humanize themselves because you can become a very flat um, kind of figurehead if, if people just see you on a piece of paper or see quotes from you. So it's how do you become a dynamic person that people wanna be around and you show energy. And that's what the in-person events hopefully do. So you have to figure out how to do that in other ways on the phone, through social networks, through talking to various leaders. Um, so you have to really move at a lot of different types of um, kind of speeds, I think. So I'm going to put a couple of questions together really quickly. Um, how did you all pick your teams? Um, it sounds like, you know, with, with all of the responsibility and, you know, how much you have to lean on your campaign managers and treasurers and event planners and everything else, um, how did you pick your teams and how do you prioritize um, who gets paid and who does it? I and mean, what does that structure look like and how did you um face it how did you come about it ooh, ooh, i want to answer this okay i uh i think that the most important thing you can do as a candidate especially a new candidate that doesn't know what you're doing i didn't have a clue where to start um is to pick a really good campaign manager that has done this before and knows what they're doing um and can give you guidance on literally everything and so uh, I'm going to give a shout out to my campaign manager with SNA Strategies, um, Sarah Brown, because she was a friend before she was my campaign manager, and we've known each other for a really long time. And um, I literally trusted her uh, to say what is the next step. And um, uh, I just, I really appreciated her leadership. And then from there, uh, built a team. I had a, you know, I want a social media person. I want someone that can help me with my volunteers. I want someone that can help me with all these different things, similar to what um, Hannah said, or excuse me, council member Legree said. And, uh, and I just asked people, like I had a friend who was a graphic designer um, and he was amazing. And he did all my graphics, which I'm really proud of. And he did all of my, um, you know, flyers. And I just asked if he'd be willing to help. And then I asked somebody else in the community that I went to college with if she would be my treasurer. And then um, through uh, my campaign manager and other people, they connected me with with several other folks who, you know, now one of them is my aide and he worked on my campaign and others, a really close friend and uh, just kind of grew this circle. And I think you're only as successful as uh, your team and the people that you surround yourself with. And uh, I can't say enough about all the people that helped me with my team from walking. I never had to walk alone. I uh, actually didn't walk with my family. I had a volunteer who went with me um, every time. Uh, and I, I think that uh, the best thing you can do is just find people that have gone through it before. Um, it's hard to figure out that balance of who do you pay, who do you not pay? Um, because really uh, everybody deserves to get paid. All of us are putting in so many hours, ourselves included, um, but the reality is we can't raise, you know, $100,000 or 75,000 for, I mean, we could, but it, it's probably not practical to do that for, yeah. <laughs> Some of us have done that, others of us have not. Um, I didn't have time, I'm a fundraiser. I spent my whole career raising money and I didn't have time to fundraise. It wasn't that I couldn't raise it. It was that I didn't have time to raise it. So um, so I, I think it, you have to make your best decision. If you have friends that are willing to help you, then you know make sure you make that clear that they're helping you for free. And if you have raised a ton of money and you can pay people, then that's great. This is a local race. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the same as a state or a national race. Um, and so I'm not saying don't pay people. If you can, that's great. I couldn't, I just couldn't pay um, many people at all. Uh, and I just was lucky enough that people were okay with that. So um, it just depends. I, I spoke too long, sorry. Like no, I you did not, absolutely not. I just wanna catch uh, Councilman Brown since he's still here. And this question is really about how, you know, people who have 
who are on currently on council. Um, in what ways do you all engage with your communities? I would love for Walt to jump in here too after we hear from uh, Councilman Brown. Um, but also, how do you prioritize the issues that your community members bring to you? I think earlier today I heard um, you mentioned that you have to love people and problems. And I know that there are a lot of problems that come your way. So how do you all prioritize that? And also, how do you um, consistently engage with your communities? Um, your constituents? Yeah, I think it's just being out, being being available and being accessible. Before COVID-19, and, and, and I'll, I'll say this about myself and other council members, we try to do our best to, to attend neighborhood association meetings to go to events and in, in, in the first district, there was, there's never a lack of events. There is now, but, um, but I, I think just being out and being accessible, uh, social media, you know, um, and email and, and phone calls and texts and neighborhood association presidents, it's, it's so many ways to uh, connect with people. You, 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 you have to figure out a way to try to funnel it. We get so many emails, uh, Tiffany Tatum uh, Madsen, that, that works for me now. She's 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 married now. Um, uh, responds uh, constantly. I mean that's that's what she does from day in to day, the, the, from the start of the business day to the to the end of the business day is responded to constituents. So you know it's a little different in COVID, um, but social media is still there, email communication is still there, phone calls are still there, and I think you just got to be attentive and in tune to what's going on. Um, I look forward to the point uh, to the point where we can get back out and see people face to face and have those conversations. Uh, we might be six feet away, but I think that's the best way uh, to connect. And then as far as prioritizing issues, um, I think you just got to take them as they come. You, you can try to sort through them, but what the new council members will find out, you'll, you'll, you'll get an issue, you'll get a problem, you'll start working with it. You take a break just to get to catch your breath and another problem shows up. So you just kind of work through those. So you're constantly working through issues. But, um, you know, there's not, a, like you said, there's not a lack of issues. You just got to try to prioritize them the best you can and then just get something done on it. Um, uh, but I will say this about being on council. Um, you have to get other council members to see the value in the issues that you bring forward. Uh, we represent a district and we are just one vote. So a lot of times for us to move the needle or to, to move funds or to take action, you got to you gotta get other council members to see the value in that. And that's part of the nuance of being a council member and being an effective one is you got to be able to make that case and bring other folks along for the ride and, and hopefully have them see the value in some of the things that may be a district issue, but it actually impacts the entire city and the whole community. I hope that I hope that answered your question. Oh, it absolutely does. Um, from I would love to hear from Cindy and Walt. Um, what are your thoughts on what potential candidates, how they should interact with your organizations? Um, and take that wherever you want. Um, but we do hopefully have some potential candidates on the call um, as attendees. So how would you how would you tell people to interact with your organizations? Well, for starters, um, for potential candidates, joining and or attending some of our meetings would be informative, I think, and helpful. But once somebody does commit to being a candidate, uh, participating in our candidate forums, filling out the voter questionnaire, those are very important pieces for us in terms of getting nonpartisan basic information out to uh, voters and we have voters who look forward to that information every year. They're always disappointed at people who don't participate. Thank you, Cindy and Walt. Uh, well, it's it's complicated. In a in a way, I agree with uh, Council Member Brown that you you kind of have to take what comes. Uh, you know, over the last day or so, I've been involved with. Uh, uh, what's called the trigger committee on the urban services boundary. I've been discussing that with people and uh, we're setting up a meeting with a consultant on the committee. Uh, there's a flood control advisory board that's meeting tomorrow on, a, on, on what amounts to a, a final development plan. Uh, 
at least Italy. And part of the issue is probably actually in uh, uh, Jennifer's district, but I think, and I think it's resolved uh, with a compromise. Um, in terms of when can, can candidate, candidates can talk to us and we'll talk about issues with them. We'll, we will tell them what we think issues are and problems. Uh, mo most things are in gray areas, how you interact with people. Uh, I, I actually really like my council member. I don't agree with her all the time, but if I, if I, if I ask her a question, I get a very quick answer and I know she's telling me the truth and is, is just straight across. And I know she's, honest and will consider anything I have to say. That doesn't mean she'll end up agreeing with me, but I really like that. Very responsive. And I don't know how she finds the time to do all the things that she does. And I think that's probably true of the council members here. Uh, but I think being responsive and knowing your issues or at least finding out or directing people in, in different places is important and working with people is, is simply important. Now with, with neighborhood leaders, I mean, you have to identify who they are. The city has a list of, uh, of all the neighborhood associations and contacts in the entire county. Now the city council uh, has been working hard to update those lists. And you know, it's good to know, uh, to look at the list and you can use the city website and, and essentially find out what is every neighborhood association in your district and the list contacts. Now, historically the list has not been very good, but, but the, uh, the current council is updating it. Uh, under COVID, it's been very difficult to communicate with people. A lot of neighborhoods are not are not meeting at all, or are not meeting nearly as much. Uh, that's sort of sliding into uh, more Zoom meetings, uh, and and that's that's going to get more and more important. It's yeah. harder to engage uh, the council on issues. Uh, yeah. uh, council council meetings don't allow people to uh, the public to speak. I mean, I mean, I see that as a real problem, and I and I understand why, but it's but it's problematic for communication to get going. Sure. If there's if there's a if there's a zoning hearing, you might be able to turn out fifty or seventy five people to a council meeting, but you're not going to get that through Zoom. So the the level of communication, uh, I think, has declined under COVID, and I see that as a problem. It is definitely something that I feel like Civic Lex has covered a lot and will continue to cover as far as transparency in our government and just having our voices heard when things are so difficult. So thank you all so much for coming. We have a few more moments before eight and I wanted to give our um, council members and our former candidate a moment to say any last words. So Hannah Legree, if you have a uh, councilwoman Legree of the third district, if you would like to leave us with anything around um, what you would have done differently for your campaign um, or any advice for those who are wanting to run. Sure. Um, I, I think, I think it, it, if you're interested in running, um, don't, don't feel nervous to ask people questions about the process um, and to start to put it out there that um, this is something that you're curious about. If, if nothing else, and I hope that there are things that, a wide range of things I can accomplish while on council, but if nothing else, I wanna be able to talk to people who are interested in um, pursuing a path in public service and, and hopefully to make that more accessible to them. Um, I know that it can be intimidating. Um, I, I know that um, not everybody has been conditioned to think of themselves as having the opportunity um, to serve or to run. And um, I just hope that if you are curious about the process, you'll stay curious and that you'll ask people in your life and people who are public servants um, and people you appreciate who you think are doing a good job in public service that, that you'll engage with them about that process and, and what it takes to run. Um, so that's my advice. Um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and, and to ask others for help along the way. It makes you vulnerable, but it's worth it. <laughs> This whole thing sounds so scary. Uh, Christine, um, what would you have done differently and or what advice would you like to give someone who was running or thinking of running? Um, what I would have done differently is um, start earlier. So, you know, I lost in the primary by 50 votes. 
which doesn't seem like a lot, but obviously I could have lost by one vote. It's every single vote matters. Um, and we were talking about mailers. So I didn't do any mailers. So if you're thinking of running, um, I think accessing and using every single mode of communication will be really, really important. Why didn't I use mailers? Mailers are expensive. I pulled out, I had, I have my um, a campaign binder here, my little envelope. So like I tried to, I wanna show you guys. So like different types of mailers, like this is a double-sided color mailer. It's about like four by six, it's pretty large. And this is from the, our other candidate. Um, and then one of our other folks, he did a three, like by a tri-folded pamphlet. Um, and then he wrote, I don't know if he did this for every house, but he wrote on the back, this is Charlie, he's really cute. He said, please switch your vote. <laughs> So, um, you know, I think having a timeline in place, like Hannah said, I think having things out release, obviously the money, um, if you are really, if you think like you're the number one person for this, I, th I think you should start today. I think you should start today, figure out who your people are. I see Stacy asking a question about the, the money part. I got a treasurer. That stuff is so confusing. And I'm telling you right now, I am a lawyer and that stuff is confusing. That, and I don't wanna be messing around with, with money and this is the Kentucky you know, state coming after me. So I think you need definitely a campaign manager and you definitely need a treasurer. Someone that knows when everything, all the financials are due, you have reports due, um, how to collect the money. Um, there are certain things about collecting money. You need everyone's address, no cash. People just can't give you cash. They have, you <laughs> if they do give you cash, you need to ask them for their address, their firstborn. I mean, it's, it's, it's intense, there are a lot of rules. I would definitely get someone on your side that knows all those rules so you don't get in trouble. Um, but that's what I would I would have done differently. I would have started earlier. If I started earlier, I would have raised more money and I would have gotten my name out there faster. So those 50 votes could have been easily accomplished um, if I didn't start in December, <laughs> the summer before it's supposed to be done. So I hope you all start today if you're thinking about it. And Jennifer? Well, uh, I think the most important thing is that you're in touch with your community and the people that live in your district. And that if you decide that you wanna run for office, that it's for the right reasons. And it's, it's to better your community, represent those people to the best of your ability and serve. Uh, and not because it's a, a position of status or because you want some sort of power or something like that. And I think if you really do care about people and your community, then um, all of the things that we've said that are so hard about this are, are worth it in the end. And so uh, if you wanna run, my suggestion is get to know your community, go to every single neighborhood association meeting in your whole district that has ever existed. Get to hear people. I started doing that over a year before, I, before uh, the election. And so I was in a primary with five candidates. And the reason why I think that I was able to connect with people is because I had already been listening to them and getting to know them, not as a candidate, but just as a person that cared. And so um, I, I think, I think that's, that's important. You have to really care. You can't pretend to care. Um, and then um, just get to know every little thing about your district that you can, every business, uh, every organization, uh, and, and just dive into that. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I feel like I was really lucky and there's not a lot of things that I, I probably would have changed um, for my campaign, uh, but I, I do think that mo moving forward, um, just trying to, to find a way to uh, have a healthy life um, outside of council is, is important. And like I said before, um, it's hard to do that. So uh, just setting those boundaries early on, even in your campaign um, is a good idea. 
Well, thank you all so much. We are right at eight o'clock. I'm so excited that we were able to stick to so close to um, our time limit and to keep you all on for this. And I just wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, we are done, so you can exit and leave. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening, but thank you all so, so very much for joining us and being with us. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much.